All right, welcome. This is seminar number five, Flesh of the Gods, Magic Mushrooms. This is the Sochi Pili Sacred Ethnobotany Club here at San Bernardino Valley College. This is what we call the Kalmekak, the instructional arm of the um, club. Um, and so uh, today we have a very interesting topic, Magic Mushrooms, Flesh of the Gods. Let's get right into it. Uh, all right, so there are 186 known species of the Salasibe genus, um, 76 of which are found in Mexico. Now, normally what we do in, um, in seminar is we talk about the description of the plants and the distribution of the plants, etc. But with 186 different species, it's going to be impossible to discuss all of the different varieties. And so um, we're really going to focus in on a couple of them, a couple of the most important ones. And so uh, we're going to be looking at, in particular, the Salasibe cubensis. It's probably the most famous, the most common um, uh, species. And so we'll discuss uh, the description and distribution of the cubensis. Uh, we'll also briefly talk about a few other species that have played uh, an important role in the history and ethnography of this sacred medicine. Uh, those two would be Salasabe Me uh, Mexicana and Salasabe Chirulensis. Um, again, those are both, uh, they're two species, two other species that have played an important role in Mexico and in particular in the Mazatec region of Huautla or of, um, of um, Oaxaca. Uh, all right, so let's describe uh, Cubensis, Salasabe Cubensis. Um, all members of the Salasabe genus are hygrophonous, meaning, oops, are hygrophonous, meaning their color shifts depending on hydration levels. All parts of the mushroom turn bluish color when handled or bruised. That's probably the easiest way to recognize a Salasabe mushroom is the, is the blue, kind of deep uh, blue bruising that uh, you see on the caps and the stems, et cetera. And that is the result of oxidation of the main psychoactive component, psilocin. We'll talk a little bit more about psilocin and psilocybin and biocystin in a little bit. Uh, the underside of the cap has dense gills, and there is a delicate veil separating the cap from the stem. All of these different characteristics are important in identifying the mushroom, okay? As you probably know, one of the difficulties of mushrooms in general is that we have edible mushrooms, we have medicinal mushrooms, and then we have poisonous mushrooms. And sometimes it's very difficult to uh, differentiate uh, a poisonous mushroom from a medicinal or ed uh, edible mushroom. And so all of these factors, all of these characteristics, color, size, shape, uh, gills, uh, uh, spores, et cetera, play a key role in identifying uh, the genus and species of the mushroom. And um, really, mushroom gathering is, should, uh, should be reserved for people that have quite a bit of experience with mushrooms. It's, it's not something that I do personally. I don't go out into the forest and look for mushrooms uh, to eat them or to use them as medicine um, and because of the danger of possibly misidentifying a mushroom. And so that's always, it's a word of wisdom, a word of caution to um, uh, mycologists, uh, 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 hobbyists or um, enthusiasts of mushrooms and mushroom culture is that um, you have to be extremely accurate in your description and your identification of these, um, of, these uh, of, of mushrooms, okay, in general. And so all of these different things that we're talking about here, color and shape and size, et cetera, all play a role in identification of the mushroom. Again, so the underside of the cap has dense gills and there is a delicate veil separating the cap from the stem. Uh, the caps of uh, cubensis measure between 15 and 80 millimeters in diameter and are often conical in immature specimens. Over time, they tend to open up and become more convex with uh, often a central bump that remains as the cap opens. The color of the caps can range from reddish cinnamon brown to golden caramel or pale yellow when mature. Uh, the, the golden kind of color of these uh, mushrooms probably lends itself to the name, uh, often they're referred to as golden teachers. 
the center of the caps are sometimes darker and speckled or mottled white uh, throughout. Uh, there are also albino variants. We'll see in a little bit here that uh, this specific species has uh, quite a bit of variation and a number of different strains have evolved over the years. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a minute. The gills start out pale grayish and gradually darken. In mature specimens, they are purplish brown, but lighter at the edges. The whitish colored stems are often slightly curved and 40 to 150 millimeters in length and can be five to 15 millimeters in thickness. The surface of the stem is smooth and the base is frequently covered with white fluffy mycelial tufts. Remember that mushrooms are um, the reproductive organ of the fungus and so um, they grow out of these mycelial networks that are uh, unseen underground, and um, they, they come up out of the ground in order to propagate the species, okay? And so you can see at the bottom of, in fact, I think in this picture here, you can kind of see a little bit of that fluffy mycelial texture at the bottom of that largest stalk there, that largest stem, a little bit right here, right along here. And so that is very representative of the mycelial networks uh, in general. Uh, the spores, uh, spores are important in identifying mushrooms as well. And I don't know if you've ever done a spore print, but the way you get a spore print is as soon as the mushroom veil uh, detaches from the bottom of the cap, you remove the cap from the stem, usually place it on a piece of white paper or probably more appropriately, a piece of aluminum foil. And then over the next several hours or possibly a day or so, all those spores will start to eject and they'll come out and they'll produce a spore print on that paper or on that aluminum foil. And then you can take those spores and you can look at them under a microscope and uh, uh, under, um, under a microscope, you can identify them and you can use that uh, to identify the mushroom. And so spores are dark purplish to brown when deposited and darken with age. They are sub ellipsoid in shape and range from 11.5 to 17 millimeter, um, micrometers uh, by eight to 11 micrometers in size, okay? I've never looked at spores under a microscope as far as identifying goes, but I have taken several spore prints and there was a time when I would spore print almost any mushroom that I found growing just for the experience to see the color, of, to see the distribution of the spores. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting process. Welcome. Uh, unlike many other species of the Psilocybe uh, genus, Cubensis is found in nature fruiting on the dung of various bovines, which is quite interesting. Uh, it, that seems to imply some kind of um, relationship with humans because bovines are uh, domesticated animals. And so uh, you've got these, uh, for whatever reason, it, it, it might be, there might be a reason that a biologist or a mycologist would be able to tell you, um, uh, for whatever reason, there seems to be kind of a, an interdependence between or an, or, or an interesting relationship between humans and mushrooms because they seem to be growing on, again, the dung of various bovines. And so that has led to a, a number of different kind of theories about the relationship between these uh, the plant medicines and humans over time. Most famously, Terence McKenna and his stoned ape theory. Uh, which is, uh, it's difficult to prove and difficult to disprove, uh, but it is quite interesting, the idea that at some point in our past, our ancient ancestors, uh, pre-humans, uh, came into contact with these um, mushrooms and, and they were the catalyst for some kind of uh, radical development uh, of, of intellect, of psyche, of, of consciousness, and the development possibly of language, art, metaphor, and religion, etc. Uh, the natural range of Cubensis has been observed throughout the southwestern United States, Mexico, Cuba, Central America, South America, India, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And like I said, we're not going to go into all of the different Psilocybe um, species, but uh, as far as I know, uh, Psilocybe mushrooms are found in all of the continents of the world. And so, uh, except uh, Antarctica, of course. 
And so they have an extremely broad and wide distribution. Uh, interestingly enough, they haven't always been used for medicinal purposes or magical purposes or religious purposes, et cetera. And really to find that kind of um, well-developed history of uh, use of psilocybe mushrooms, you, we really need to look to Mexico. And when we get to ethnography at the end here, we'll discuss quite a bit of uh, the use of these uh, mushrooms in Mexico. All right, uh, since the 1976 publication of the McKenna Brothers Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Growers Guide, Cubensis has been a favorite cultivar of mycologists, hobbyists, hippies, and psychonauts because it's highly adaptable to a range of environments and quite a bit more resistant to contamination than other psilocybes. Naturally, this led to extensive genetic isolation, increased potency, and diverse appearances. And there are now upwards of 60 distinct cubensis strains. And so if you're familiar with, for example, um, cannabis, you've got the species cannabis sativa or cannabis indica. And then you've got all these kind of different manifestations, right? All these different strains, different qualities and characteristics and smells and, and, and um, colors and flavors, et cetera. And so it's kind of similar to that, this idea that uh, over time, as people have been um, you know, cultivating these mushrooms, they've taken on different characteristics. Uh, and there are some in, in fact that are, are quite interesting uh, and actually have specific stories where an individual has been credited with developing one specific strain. I'm thinking of, um, don't be offended, but I'm thinking of the penis envy strain which I think if you're looking up there on that screen, it's the one on the top second from the left. And you can probably figure out why it got that name. Um, so I've got here, I've got a copy of uh, the McKenna Brothers uh, Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Growers Guide. And so those of you online, uh, unfortunately, aren't gonna be able to see that, but I'm gonna pass this around uh, the classroom. And again, that was really the first publication that, uh, that made popular this idea of cultivating the mushroom at home. And uh, they did it before anyone else. And it was a time in the 1970s where uh, this is, you know, six years after uh, a lot of these uh, plant medicines were made illegal and were um, categorized into, um, uh, well, made illegal uh, in the United States. And so they, in fact, published that book under the pseudonyms there, OTOS and O N O O O Eric. Let's see if we can see it right there. And so it says forward by Terence McKenna, but he was actually the one that wrote it. Him and his brother uh, Dennis McKenna. Terence McKenna, famous psychonaut, philosopher, lecturer, etc. And Dennis McKenna, his brother, who ended up with a PhD in ethnobotany from, I believe, the University of Hawaii, and is now a professor at the University of British Columbia. And so they did a lot of kind of the pioneering work in the early days of um, exploring the best techniques. To, uh, to produce and cultivate magic mushrooms. All right. Um, again, guys, um, these meetings, these classes, uh, seminars, lectures, or whatever you want to call them, are uh, hopefully they are they are interactive. Okay, and so um, one of the things that we've been developing recently is on Discord. There's a link to a um, a Google um, a Google Drive, I believe, that has a number of different academic articles on a lot of these topics that we are are looking at. Not just magic mushrooms, but any of them. A lot of them in Spanish. A lot of them in English. Some are are kind of generic. Some of them are very very specific. And so uh, I'm I'm really hoping that over time this develops into a more of an interactive uh, activity. And so if at any time you guys have a question or a comment, um, please uh, chime in. In fact, as we get here to active molecules and effects, I might have to rely on Jesse a little bit <laughs> for, uh, for some descriptions and some clarifications, et cetera. I'm sure there'll be something that he'll want to correct um, that I might say, and I'll be willing to be corrected. Uh, we have a, have a question here. I think this is from Selena. She says, question, so you can uh, backyard mushrooms, uh, so can backyard mushrooms be hallucinating? I seen on Netflix show called How to Change the Mind stating that you can, uh, that they can be. What's your opinion on that? Okay, good. So um, the show that you're referring to there is Michael Pollan's 
um, uh, it's based on a book by Michael Pollan, who is a, um, he's a writer and a journalist, and he did a lot of work uh, with uh, just food in general. And then, um, and then he kind of uh, shifted over into some of these interesting um, plants and some animals, including I think the Buf Bufus alvarius toad. And he experimented with some of these substances and he wrote a very, a very good introduction to the topic in that book, How to Change Your Mind. And so I would definitely recommend that either on Netflix, the, the show, I think it's a, probably a multi-part series, four-part series, I think, uh, based on his book. And so I would say um, that uh, that uh, it's possible that you might find a, a mushroom in your backyard that's a, a hallucinogen, but in Southern California, it's not likely. Um, it's probably, you probably have to go up into the Central Coast up into Northern California, where there's a little bit more humidity, a little bit more rainfall, a little bit more green in order to find some of those um, uh, mushrooms that psilocybin mushrooms. And so the chances of you finding one in Southern California, I would say are probably zero, probably. You never know, but uh, probably zero. We have a comment or a question, I think real loud because we have a, a our mic is up here, Athena. Yeah, definitely. In fact, I think, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book Into the Wild. I think it was written by John Krakauer. It's about a young man who graduated high school or graduated college and then just kind of went off up to Alaska to live by himself. And I believe that he ended up uh, poisoning him, accidentally poisoning himself with a mushroom and ended up dying. Uh, in isolation up in, in Alaska. And so, um, yeah, the, the possibility of poisoning yourself is always there. And so it's it, this is not something for the amateur to go out first time, let's look for some mushrooms and let's start self-assaying. That's, <laughs> that's dangerous. Um, there's a common saying uh, about, about shamanism. It says, there are old shamans and there are bold shamans, but there are no old and bold shamans. And so the idea there being that a bold shaman will just try anything and see what happens, right? And so the implication there is that there might be uh, death or, or, or sickness involved there. All right, uh, going back here to uh, the active molecules and their effects. Uh, so we've got, um, let's see, I think I might need to do that. So of course we have psilocybin. Uh, we also have uh, psilocin. I think that's probably spelled with an I there, not a Y, sorry about that. And then we also have baocystin, all right? These are the principal active molecules of the psilocybe gen uh, genus. There might be some others as well. That's always one of the things about using these natural medicines is that there might be some other compounds in there that might have some other kind of effect on the experience. And so um, that's something to keep in mind, okay? Most of the research indicates that psilocin and psilocybin are the primary psycho psychoactive agents. Um, psilocybin is a phosphorylated precursor form of psilocin and is the more stable of the two. It's also known as 4-phosphoryloxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine. How did I do, Jesse? Did I get it close? <laughs> We'll see. Um, and it's quite good. <laughs> and so uh, it's an indole alkaloid, which has similar structure to LSD and DMT. And um, uh, psilocin, known as 4-hydroxy-dimethyltryptamine, is a substituted tryptamine alkaloid and a serotonergic psychedelic substance, all right? It acts on the 5-HT2A receptors and modulates the production and reuptake of serotonin. This is all fancy stuff to me. Uh, I'm more of a humanities guy. I'm more interested in the experience and describing the experience and less familiar with the science. Um, and so um, if there's something else there that you guys want to add to that, that would, that would be great. 
Um, but what it seems to do is it seems to be, it seems to be, have an affinity for those 5-HT2A receptors, all right? And so it interacts with serotonin. And serotonin, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, plays a, a, a large role in things like our mood and, and things like that. And so uh, this is something that, um, this is kind of a contribution that psychedelics have made to science is that the, 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 the connection between serotonin, the discovery of serotonin and these substances here is very, very close and very similar. And so it kind of goes hand in hand. It, and the more we learn about the mind and, and these receptors, and serotonin, like the more we learn about these substances and vice versa. And so there's a very close relationship between these, um, these molecules and the naturally occurring not molecules that we have in our body that regulate things like neural communication and emotion and, and mood and things like that. Uh, okay, so we've got a comment here. Jesse says, meaning one of the red oxygen atoms would, uh, would have a white hydrogen atom attached. Good. Perfect. I love the um, the chemistry um, in there. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'm not going to say much more about the active molecules here uh, for fear of getting something wrong here, but I, I'd like to get into the effects. And that's, I think it's going to be, uh, it's quite a bit more interesting, I think, not that there's anything wrong with uh, chemistry here, guys. All right. So the effect after 15 to 30 minutes of consumption, the first signs of intoxication are usually like a light nausea, okay? This is often followed by maybe some weird effects like yawning, all right? I, I don't really know what the origin of the yawning is, but it seems quite common for people to have, you know, a five to 10 minute spate of yawning, all right? After that dissipates, the yawning and the nausea kind of goes away. Um, subjects might feel, you know, cold or something like that. Um, and then they start to notice that colors seem brighter and more saturated, better defined, clearer. Space and time might seem to start to warp a little bit. The way that you view space and time seems to change a little bit here. Um, objects might seem larger or smaller than normal, or they might seem closer or, or more distant. Uh, time might seem to pass more slowly. The senses are heightened. Um, if you're familiar with the effects of cannabis, uh, they're, they're quite similar in that regard, is that there's kind of a spatial, a temporal spatial distortion where, you know, it looks like something's close enough to touch, you can't really touch it, or, or time seems to go real slow. And so in that regard, they seem very similar, at least in kind of those in, in, in effect there. Uh, objects might start to wave. You, straight lines might seem like they're kind of moving a little bit. Um, objects might seem to pulse or vibrate or uh, inanimate objects might appear to breathe or become infused with life. Uh, wood grain patterns might appear as flowing rivers or complex artistic and architectural designs seem to overlay everything that you look at especially repetitive patterns like tiles. Everything seems infused with meaning. And if you haven't experienced it, I don't know if that makes much sense to you, but things you hear, things you see, seem to be rich with symbolism. Um, white light can seem to fracture and maybe even split into the prism of the rainbow. At higher doses, faces might seem to morph, and maybe take on different shapes, sometimes of animals or aliens or monsters or insects or other fantastical creatures. Uh, visions of an individual's future death and destruction or success and wealth are not uncommon. The soul seems to become heightened and aroused and the contrasting feel of the biological body can seem decadent, imperfect, finite, or corrupt, and maybe even disgusting. Um, it makes me think of a, a comedian that regularly talks about this. His name is, um, see if I can remember, Duncan Trussell, who usually calls, I think he calls the body the meat bag or something like that. He does it kind of, uh, you know, as a joke, but but that might kind of be the feeling that, that maybe the spirit or soul is more pure 
and and you might feel that the body is is a little bit more corrupt, right? It's it's um, it's mortal, right? You can you can feel your mortality. The 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 power of the mortality kind of becomes more clear, I think, in your mind. Uh, Carl Jung's archetypes seem to abound everywhere you look. Uh, the artificiality of cultural constructions seem readily apparent and can start to dissolve, leading the individual the individual to come face to face with something that seems more like eternal truth. This evokes the famous quote by William Blake, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks in his cavern. The psychedelic experience seems to dissolve the cultural, propagandistic, and dogmatic programming that we are assailed with on a daily basis. It breaks down the walls of the cavern and lets you see things in a way that seem more real than reality itself. At extremely high doses, and this would be what Terence McKenna calls the heroic dose, which would be five dried grams of mushrooms in silent darkness. At extremely high doses, the ego can seem to merge with the surroundings. This could include plants and animals, as well as inanimate objects. As the sense of self dissolves, a feeling of universal consciousness and oneness with the environment and everything in the universe becomes stronger and stronger. Other dimensions seem to open up and interaction with spirits, entities, gnomes, intelligent balls of light, ancestors, gods, angels, and demons are not uncommon. Um, any comments or questions about effects? Um, in general, let me just say this, that uh, remember these psychedelics, as Stan Groff says, Dr. Stan Groff, who has a, a tremendous amount of experience in this field as a practitioner, uh, a psychiatrist um, uh, practicing, I think he's led, I don't know, several thousand LDS, uh, LSD trips. Um, uh, Stan Groff says, uh, psychedelics are a non-specific amplifier. And so to say that the effects are the same for every single person would be would be, I think, incorrect or quite possibly inaccurate. It's kind of like whatever it is that you bring to the game gets increased. And so if you bring a desire for healing, if you bring a desire for understanding, if you bring a desire for problem solving, then those things will be addressed in your experience. And if you bring anxiety and, and, um, and negative feelings and emotions, uh, uh, then, then it's it's possible that those get increased and amplified, and so anytime you're even considering uh, using any of these uh, important plant medicines, I realize mushrooms aren't plants, here, guys. It's it's just part of the category. You really need to make sure that you are grounded and that you're in a a um, kind of a safe and secure and uh, a safe and secure kind of mental space. All right. Um, now, no one obviously is going to be 100% free from any type of anxiety or, or problem in life, uh, but you really need to make sure that you're grounded psychologically, mentally, socially, before you even attempt to experiment or, or work with any of these substances. Uh, we've got a couple of comments here. Uh, this is from Selena, I think. I'm still unsure about the whole demon theories. All right. Um, well, um, you know, uh, I don't know. Is there something else that you're that you're maybe I can address with that? I don't know. Uh, I'm not saying that, oh, you take a psilocybin mushroom and you will see demons. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is people have seen demons or, you know, and so spirits or entities or intelligences or whatever. And anytime you're working in these spaces, this would be kind of the quote unquote shamanic space where you're accessing other dimensions, other realms, you're engaging with spirit uh, energies, there's always a chance that you might come across an energy that isn't uh, completely harmless, that's to say. And you might feel, I don't know, a, 
you might feel that it's it's a negative uh, energy or something like that. And so a demon is a word that, you know, I mean, what does that mean? It, it's usually taken in kind of the Christian sense, meaning devil or something like that. But I mean, it doesn't have to be. It's just, again, one of kind of the flaws of, of language here is that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, they could, it could even be demons within, you know, the kind of the past traumatic experiences that have kind of left you affected and it might feel like you have a negative energy inside of you. And so whether or not they're actual spirits or whatever, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to know, um, but this is just kind of one of the ways that people have interpreted it. And so I don't know, um, Selena, if that uh, helps at all. Uh, so what are demons? So what are demons? Well, I mean, I guess it just, it depends. Again, it depends on how we're defining demon, you know? A person that has kind of a, a a Christian educational foundation would say those are evil spirits, right? Um, other people might say that, again, if, if you're an atheist, it might be repressed uh, memories of past trauma that are continuing to affect you to, to this day. And so demon is, is kind of a word that kind of resists understanding in a lot of different ways because it kind of depends on how you, you define it. Um, Lucia says, do people often take it with others similar to ayahuasca groups, or is it something that can be safe for a personal experience? And so a couple comments there, Lucia, <clears throat> I would say that um, as opposed to what we saw with the ayahuasca, kind of the traditional Amazonian ayahuasca experience, which is usually almost always communal, that's to say a large group of individuals taking the substance, the plant at the same time, usually uh, what you see in like a more modern Mexican mushroom um, um, velada or a, um, a mushroom, uh, what do you call it when you stay up all night in English? What's it called when, in English? Velori. What do you call that in English though? I forgot the word in English. No, a vigil, a mushroom vigil. Sometimes I think in Spanish. I can't remember the English. So in the traditional Mexican mushroom vigil, it's almost always one, two, or three people. It's a very small, small, intimate group. And so uh, we'll get to this in a little bit here when we start talking about ethnography and kind of the more modern age and Maria Sabina. Uh, but what, what she would do is you have an individual that has a problem, right? That's essentially what shamanism is is a member of the group, has a problem, and they go to an individual who has the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom uh, in these spaces in, uh, with spiritual things, and that individual uh, might have the ability to help the person overcome their problem, whether it's spiritual, psychological, mental, or social, or physical. And so the patient, quote unquote patient, would go to the practitioner, the shaman, Maria Sabina, curandero is usually what they're called, a healer. And often it would either be the patient takes the mushroom uh, or the shaman takes the mushroom or the patient and the shaman take the mushroom together. And they have kind of a, a similar experience. And so, Lucia, I think you're right. It does seem to be a little bit more of an intimate experience, uh, uh, smaller groups, much, much smaller groups, as opposed to the ayahuasca experience. And I would also say that another um, kind of common understanding about these substances is the idea of having a trip sitter. And so if you say, is it something that can be safe for a personal experience? Um, I, 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 I imagine that it can be safe for a personal individual experience. But what a lot of people kind of rely on is the idea of having something called a trip sitter. So a person that is familiar with the experience, familiar with the substance, whether it's LSD, peyote, ayahuasca, mushrooms, or whatever, they're familiar with it. They might even take a very, very, very light dose in order to kind of get onto the quote unquote same wavelength as the individual. And then, but that person then, the trip sitter can kind of help facilitate the experience. They can make sure that no one comes knocking at the door. They can make sure that if, you know, if you're out in a park or a wild space or something, they can make sure that, you know, um, that, that no one's going to interrupt. 
they can in interact with individuals that uh, that are you know straight that are, that aren't under the influence of these substances, and they can kind of help you if if the individual if the patient is having a difficult time. A lot of times, all that's necessary is is a, a minor suggestion. Hey, why don't we go inside? Or hey, let's go walk around the lake. Or hey, why don't you listen to some music? Um, it's usually it needs to be a person of confidence, a person that you're comfortable with. Not someone that you don't know, not someone that you just barely met, someone that 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 you um, can can feel vulnerable with, because often these substances create kind of a suggestibility and a vulnerability that leaves the individual at risk of of some type of harm. And so, um, a trip sitter is highly recommended. Someone that's familiar with the substance that might take a little bit themselves that can facilitate your experience, et cetera, help uh, prevent the person from, you know, walking out into the street or something like that. Um, so good question there. Okay, so Selena says, this is good info. So should depressed people avoid taking a trip? Um, you often hear this advice is that, um, is that if a person is prone to serious or significant psychological conditions, bipolar, manic depressive, uh, um, you know, schizophrenia or something like that, it, it might not be highly recommended to work with these substances because, um, uh, you know, there are stories that come out every once in a while about individuals that have some kind of, a, a, kind of like a temporary psychotic break. Uh, and there are other kind of situations where individuals that that are prone to these types of conditions, that it that these substances can be the the push that that kind of sends them into a down you know downward spiral or something like that. Comment or, or question, Misty. Um, Good. So um, I don't know if you could hear online there, but a couple of things were raised there. The first is microdosing, and the second is the beneficial uh, kind of the the beneficial aspects of this as a medicine. And so um, I think those both of those need to be addressed. I think. Um, and then Jesse is online saying there's evidence that it can uh, can help for um, depression as well. And so, yeah, and I think uh, the, the specific type of depression that I've heard it uh, helping with is a treatment resistant depression. So that would be depression that that you've tried to fix with pharmaceuticals or whatever. And I think I think it has to be two. You've tried at least two different types of pharmaceuticals and they haven't helped your depression. And so under those circumstances, they've done a little bit of testing, a little bit of experimentation. Uh, it's mainly out of Johns Hopkins. I think that's what Jesse posted, um, Hopkins, yeah. And so it's mainly Johns Hopkins. And uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the professor there. It's, uh, I don't remember his name, uh, but, but they've been doing that a lot of work out of Johns Hopkins. In fact, I think they just set up a psychedelic center to advance research in this area. And so um, treatment resistant depression is, it, it seems that under controlled circumstances where an individual has, you know, um, uh, uh, meets with a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist several times to kind of assess where they are and, and what, what they're suffering. Uh, it seems that if they go in for one of these one of these uh, treatments, which basically involves you taking a, a certain amount of psilocybin, it's not in the mushroom form, it's in the, it's in the pure chemical form. You take a certain amount of psilocybin 
And then you basically lie down on a couch and you put a cover over your eyes and you listen to a Johns Hopkins playlist. It sounds funny, but you can find it online, the Johns Hopkins Magic Mushroom Experiment playlist, uh, which is a kind of a, a curated list of a lot of, lots of different types of music and classical music and this type of music. And, and then uh, and then basically you just lie there and you go through, you know, to one, two, three, maybe, I can't imagine it's four hours, but probably three hours or so, just lying there in darkness, listening to music. And then after that, uh, you, you, have, uh, you, you meet with this counselor and you discuss the experience. And it seems to be extremely beneficial for lots of interesting things, not just this, this treatment resistant depression, but other things like smoking cessation. And so people that are addicted to tobacco, uh, can go in, have one of these sessions under very, very controlled circumstances, right? Um, it's not just go take a bunch of mushrooms and go to a party or a rave or something like that. It's uh, with a professional counselor uh, under these control, in a controlled environment. And the, um, the rates of success are something like 80%, which is remarkable, which is greater than any other pharmaceutical smoking cessation aid. I think the next best is like 20% or 15%. And so there seems to be uh, with, with certain conditions, whether it's depression or PTSD or uh, you know ad addiction, there seems to be a great benefit. Um, I, I'm not prepared to go into it that uh, too far, but I, I think it's called the default mode network, which is the part of your brain and which, which a lot of these substances seem to kind of affect. And it seems to kind of, kind of, for lack of a better word, it seems to kind of reset your mind, all right? And so if you have, if your mind has been plagued with 15 years of nicotine and cigarette addiction, it seems like these substances can kind of go in and kind of reset, you know? It's kind of like a flip the breakers. And, and it allows you to kind of see things new and, and kind of gives you a fresh view of life and your experience with the substance and how possibly the relationship that you might have with the, with the plant tobacco, which we're going to talk about in the future, uh, the, the relationship that you're having with the plant is not a healthy relationship. And so these substances, peyote or, or ibogaine, right, iboga in Africa, um, uh, seem to, to have an effect on addiction, whether it's heroin addiction or nicotine addiction or whatever. And so um, and I would also say that in addition to all of those things, there's also some very interesting and compelling research coming out of Johns Hopkins and other places. I think UCLA and New York University is also doing this a little bit with regards to end of life anxiety. And so this is basically for people that have a terminal cancer, for example, they know they're gonna die in six months, and they aren't, who, who would feel good about knowing that they're gonna die, but they have a, an added or increased leveling of anxiety about their future and the prognosis of their condition. And so it seems that under the same or similar conditions where you go in with a, a, a trained practitioner and under controlled environment, uh, you can have this experience. It seems to reduce or eliminate the anxiety of, of of death almost immediately. And people come to kind of an understanding and an acceptance of their role in the universe and what may or may not happen after death. And it seems to be an incredibly powerful uh, medicine in that regard. Uh, we've got some good things up on uh, online. What's a psychotic break, if you don't mind me asking us. Okay, psychotic break would be, you know, going in, it, going into you know, some type of, of schizophrenic state or something like that. Uh, I don't know if, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind, which is based on a professor who had schizophrenia. He ended up winning the Nobel prize for his work in economics and game theory. Uh, but I think that movie gives you a good idea of what a psychotic break is. It's where your grasp on reality starts to become more and more tenuous, all right? And so in that movie, you can see there are times where he seems quite normal and high functioning. And there, then there are times where he feels that he's a spy working with secret agents, delivering messages, decoding messages from newspapers. 
And so that is the split from reality. Why? Because he would never was a spy. He wasn't working with secret agents and he didn't have any messages to decode in newspapers. And so that kind of the, the, the disconnect from reality, I guess that is what I would call a psychotic break. And of course, um, if we have anyone that is more familiar with psychology, psychiatry, et cetera, I would love to hear what you have to say. Um, yeah, like a realization, I would say maybe the opposite of a realization. It's where your connection with reality has become, <laughs> has become stressed and you don't see things as they really are. You see things in kind of a different way, okay? Uh, erasing doubts or fears. Uh, yeah, Lucia, I think uh, in, with regards to end of life anxiety, I think that's what it is, is that, uh, that it seems to have the effect of being able to erase your doubts or fears about what's going to happen to me after I die, et cetera. And there seems to be kind of a more, uh, people seem more likely to accept the inevitable and not in a negative way, in a very positive way. Um, it should be pointed out that a lot of times people that are in these experiments will come out and, and say things like, that was one of the uh, top five most spiritual and important experiences of my life, right up there with the birth of my first child. And so uh, under the right circumstances, uh, the, these types of experiences can be extremely rewarding, extremely fulfilling. And, and um, when we get to DMT, when we talk a little bit more about DMT, probably with the snuffs, South American snuffs, um, people that take DMT often uh, will, after the experience, they will, uh, if, for example, a person is an atheist, they have no belief in God whatsoever. After a DMT experience, they often will say, I think I believe in God now. It's something like 50% of people that experienced of atheists that have a DMT trip um, have some type of belief in some type of higher power after the experience. And so these are incredible, incredible substances here. Um, I think we need to move on here a little bit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about ethnography. <laughs> and we're gonna divide this up into three different categories here, pre-conquest, uh, colonial and modern. And here's the thing, we're going to be talking almost exclusively about Mexico here, because Mexico uh, provides, um, bar none, it provides the greatest, um, the greatest kind of corpus of knowledge and experience with these substances. Almost no one else was experimenting with these before the 20th century. Uh, but Mexico has a long history of, of use and practice. Uh, with the psilocybin mushrooms. And interestingly enough, uh, even though these mushrooms are found throughout the world, no other societies, no other civilizations were doing them. Um, we, have no, uh, we have no proof or no record whatsoever from you know, what is today the United States or Canada, none from South America, none from Africa. I mean, we have tiny, tiny, tiny little bit from Africa is like one rock carving of the bee shaman from Algeria. And it looks like his body is covered in little tiny mushrooms, right? Something from like 2000 years ago or something. Um, almost nothing from Europe. Uh, you know, we have, you have Liberty caps, which are psilocybin mushrooms in Europe, but it doesn't appear that we have a record of their use. Doesn't seem like we, there was anything going on in China. It, Mexico really seems to be the epicenter of uh, psilocybin mushroom use, and we have um, we have quite a bit of of, of interesting evidence of uh, their use uh, over the past hundreds and possibly thousands of years. And so, uh, all of this will be a discussion of basically Mexico. Okay, and so as far as pre-conquest goes, this would be before 1492, uh, and really it's 1519 to 1521 is when the conquest when the Spaniards uh, arrive in Mexico. But before, you know, before 1492, um, we don't have a lot of evidence of, of use in Mexico. Um, the most commonly referenced um, evidence is the mushroom stones from uh, Guatemala and Central America. It's mainly the highlands of Guatemala, which are these uh, small effigies of um, carved out of stone that appear to be mushrooms with usually 
some kind of small deity or animal or or spirit or 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 idol, right? Uh, as part of the mushroom stone, and so uh, something like two hundred or two hundred and fifty of these have been found, and so again, they're from Guatemala area and possibly down into um, El Salvador, Honduras, or Nicaragua. And um, the idea is that they were part of some type of mushroom cult, maybe even used as um, as a as a, a a mortar, like a mortar and pestle to, to crush up the mushrooms, although we don't have a whole lot of, of, of um, proof of that. Uh, and so that, that's kind of, uh, that's almost it as far as kind of pure indigenous proof of mush, mushroom consumption in uh, Mexico. And almost all of the rest of the information that we have comes through the filter of the Spanish Chronicles. And um, thanks, Jesse, we appreciate you. So um, all of the rest of the information that we have about the use of these mushrooms comes through the filter of the Spanish Chronicles. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, obviously, you can see the problem with that is that it's it's getting filtered through this cultural lens of, of someone that isn't familiar with the mushroom. And that would uh, it often leads to declarations that, um, um, you know, they're getting drunk on these mushrooms and communicating with the devil is usually how that kind of ends up. And so we see that picture right there up on the screen. That is from Bernardino de Sahagún's The Florentine Codex, which is one of the greatest works of anthropology in, in you know, the last 500 years. And it's, um, but it, it kind of shows a person probably eating mushrooms. We have some oddly colored red and green mushrooms that appear to be growing there. And then we have a representation of what's probably Miklanticutli behind uh, the person which is the lord of the underworld and so the idea there is eat mushrooms and i don't know see the devil or something like that and that's usually how the spanish um catholic authorities interpreted the use of this mushroom is that it would make people see visions of the devil and communicate with the devil and the devil would tell them things that are going to happen in the future right and so that's obviously a very problematic uh cultural lens um, and, and so it's difficult to look at all of the chronicles and a lot of the writings, the Spanish writings and get an objective view of, of the mushroom, but there are good kind of descriptions of its use. And, um, we can see, for example, um, there were several several Tlatoanis, the first was Tisok and the second was Motekusuma, uh, that, that consumed magic mushrooms at their coronation. And so uh, they're, you know, they would say they would go and they would collect these mushrooms in the, in the early morning hours and they would take them and they would eat them usually um, fresh, right? Fresh, and if not fresh, sometimes they would uh, put them in honey. And so uh, honey is an incredible preservative. Even today, uh, you know, there's honey that's been around for thousands of years and it doesn't go bad because it has such powerful antimicrobial microbial, um, properties. And so they would store sometimes the mushrooms in the honey. Uh, you can even, if you store mushrooms in honey, it will also, the psilocybin will leach into the honey and you can make uh, um, magic honey. And so they would consume it with honey or sometimes with chocolate, usually as a drink. And um, they, they used it as a way to celebrate the coronation of, of the emperor. And, um, and so they used it in that regard. They used it, uh, there are several instances and I'm referring, I'm referring mainly to Diego Duran's History of the Indies of New Spain. That's the book that has um, quite a bit of information about the use of uh, what they called Teonanacat. And so uh, teonanakat is the uh, Nahuatl word. Let's see if you can see it up on the board here. Teonanakat is um, the flesh of the gods. Teo means God. Nanakat means flesh. And so um, starting with Bernardino de Sahagún, who uh, received most of, of his, the information that he put into his Florentine Codex, received that from 
uh, indigenous uh, contributors. They would, they would work with him and they would tell him information and they would often even write it down. And so we have the Florentine Codex, which is a beautiful example of Spanish and Nahuatl. And, um, and that's where we got this name Teonanaka, the flesh of the gods. And so um, they would consume this uh, ritually. Uh, Montezuma, Montezuma would sometimes have his uh, astrologers and diviners and priests consume uh, the, the mushroom in order to access information that is not normally available. And this is essentially divination. Um, and so, uh, you know, aside from the idea that you can use these special plants as a form of healing, as a medicine, right? Like kind of like we saw with ay ayahuasca for, for psychological problems, mental problems, social problems, physical problems, et cetera. So there's a healing component to these substances, but then there's also this fascinating divination aspect to these substances. And, um, and usually it's uh, what's gonna happen in the future, right? Like I wanna go to war with these, these other people, will I defeat them or will they defeat me? And so you might go to a practitioner, have them consume uh, the mushroom and have them receive uh, kind of inspiration, revelation, et cetera, about whether or not you'll be successful in war. Um, there's also uh, this idea that you use the mushrooms in order to find lost or stolen objects. And you might think, well, what does one thing, healing the body, have to do with the other thing? finding something that you lost. And I've kind of, I've kind of been thinking about this for a long time. And, and I think my, my best understanding of, of this is both of those problems, sickness and you lost something or someone stole something from you. Both of those problems require you to get knowledge that you don't have. Okay. And so the idea is, I don't know what's making me sick and I don't know what to do to heal myself. Okay. And then I lost, you know, someone, someone stole my cow and I need to know who it was. I need to know where to find my cow. And so you, you, the idea here of divination is you're accessing knowledge or information that isn't normally readily available to us. Okay. And in fact, I want to share something that's quite interesting. It's from a book called Substance and Seduction, Ingested Commodities in Early Modern Mesoamerica. You see that there? And it's an article by Martin Nesvig. It's called Sandcastles of the Mind, Hallucinogens and Cultural Memory. And he tells the story here of a young, um, I think we're actually gonna move on to the colonial period here. Uh, so he tells the story of a young Criollo rancher in Mexico that has an experience with magic mushrooms and it's remarkable. I've never found anything like this in any of the other literature, and I've been through almost all of it. All right. So if you'll indulge me, this will probably take five minutes. Um, it says, Gonzalo Perez, a young Criollo rancher, had been married to his first love, Ines Martin. Gonzalo and his father, Pedro Perez de Garfias, worked together as labradores and did not claim citizen status in Tashima, Tashimaroa. Okay, though Pedro Perez's wife, Catalina de Olivares, had two nieces in town married to vecinos. One of those nieces, Mariana de la Cruz, owned a black Ladina slave. One suspects that the Perez and Olivares families were Creole and the less wealthy relatives of the de la Cruz family. We know nothing of Ines Marti, Martin's background, though she is not named as a mestiza or mulata which may imply either Creole ethnicity or vaguely mixed mestiza background. Ines had left Gonzalo Perez for some days. Had he been abusing her or had she gone to look for a new man? We cannot know. Gonzalo was distraught. He went to speak with a local indigenous man, Josefillo, his father's servant, who knew of the sacred mushroom. The Nahuatl term nanacate bled into the Spanish lexicon untranslated from the Spanish notary Don Guillermo Padilla, who apparently did not ask for clarification of the term. 
Gonzalo Perez, along with his extended family, seemed to know that Josefillo was an, ad, was an, adept, uh, was an adept in hallucinogen consumption. At the least, the man knew where to find such plants. Gonzalo was, by his own admission, desperate to find his wife, who had left him for several days. And so Gonzalo's problem, Gonzalo's problem here is, where's my wife? Right? That's the knowledge that he didn't have. So Gonzalo was, by his own admission, desperate to find his wife, who had left him for several days. Gonzalo took two small pieces of nanacate, that's nanacar, okay? took two small pieces of nanakate the first time and discovered nothing. Perhaps the nanakate was not strong enough. He returned to Josefillo, accusing him of being a fraud and a sorcerer. Josefillo gave him five mushrooms this time. These seemed to do the trick. It started slowly, mild nausea, a sense that time was slowing down. Distances were far, then near, alternating immense yet painfully close. Perched safely at the base of the mountain, Gonzalo bundled himself up in the cool evening. The bitter aftertaste of the nanakate lingered. The greens in the Tashimar Tashimaroa mountains were almost too much to bear. He could hear the ants crawling along a distant log. Calls of magpies a mile away sounded as if they were only feet away. Suddenly, a snake appeared. Not an ordinary snake, but a snake who spoke Spanish. The snake undulated, pulsing as if the shape were breathing like a grotesque lung. The snake asked Gonzalo what he wanted to know. Gonzalo wept. He loved his young bride and missed her. The snake said, look around and you will find her. Gonzalo did as the snake instructed. His mind flew through canyons and up and around hills he soared, collapsing geographic space through the power of the Nanakatl. As it, at a distance of a couple miles, his mind flying through the space, he saw his wife sitting beneath an apple tree, combing her hair. Gonzalo was, res, was relieved but terrified. His mind body returned to the village, walking down the slope of the hill, having returned from his flight. He begged his mother to retrieve his wife from the glen two miles away. His mother recoiled, fearing that her son had been bewitched. What is wrong with you, my son? She asked. Gonzalo replied, nothing. She placed a rosary around his neck. He looked down. The rosary became a swirling centipede. He snatched it off his neck and hurled it to the ground, terrified of the creature. Catalina de Olivares did, in fact, find her daughter-in-law in the very place her son said he had seen her, half a league away in an orchard near the house of her, near the house of her niece. Olivares suspected the work of the devil, Yet no one reported this to a priest, as there was no resident priest in the area. And it was only when Baez came to announce the edict of the faith in the town that it was recorded. No one was quite sure if Nanakate was the work of the devil, but they were, but they were certain that someone would find out. An ounce of political precaution threw the young man to the commissarios uh, questioning. The inquisitors, on hearing the report, did not indicate any particular concern no trial record is extant. It's truly remarkable. Um, I, like I said, I've never read anything like that before, um, where you have a detailed explanation of accessing information that's beyond your ability. Um, that was, as I said, all recorded. It wasn't a part of an inquisition tr trial, but it was recorded by um, a, a priest that visited the area. Um, so that's quite remarkable. Um, let's move on a little bit here. Um, that was from the colonial time. That's I think that's a, I think that's a 17th century. Let's move forward a little bit um, and get into more modern times. And this is where we need to talk a little bit about um, Maria Sabina and um, and her contribution to our understanding of uh, the magic mushroom. Uh, and so, and it's also the origin of the name magic mushroom itself. And so, um, you've got in in uh, the 1930s and 40s, you've got uh, Richard Evans Schultes, who is considered the father of modern uh, American ethnobotany, um, traveling down to Mexico and um, and searching for what would what what he thought was the magic mushroom. There was an idea that maybe it was peyote, and we didn't know it for certain. 
And so Western science really wasn't very familiar with the magic mushroom yet. And so Richard Evans Schultes is the first person to go down there and identify the mushroom and, and, um, and start the process of scientifically studying the mushroom. Um, he passed that information on to a number of other people. And in the 1950s, it would be um, R. Gordon Wasson who would travel down to Mexico and would uh, meet with Maria Sabina. And Maria Sabina was a curandera who lived, is a Mazatec Indian curandera who lived in Huautla de Jimenez in Oaxaca, Mexico. And um, he uh, asked her if he would, if he could join her in a magic mushroom vigil. And uh, she introduced him to the magic mushroom. He consumed the magic mushroom in a ritual uh, context um, and had an experience that he wrote up in a Life magazine article. An editor uh, titled the article In Search of the Magic Mushroom. And that's the origin of our quote unquote magic mushrooms. And so our Gordon, our Gordon Wasson was a very interesting guy. He was a, um, he was the vice president of JP J. Um, Morgan Bank, and he was in charge of public relations. And he was married to a Russian woman that uh, uh, was very familiar with mushrooms. And they, they started kind of a lifelong, um, a lifelong search and study of mushrooms and their use throughout the world. And he published a book called um, Russia and Mushrooms and History, I believe. It's kind of a landmark work in the study of mushrooms and, and the religious context in which they're used. And, um, and in his article, he talked about his experience and he talked about the visions that he had and he talked about the things that he saw and how the mushrooms affected him. And famously, that article influenced um, um, Leary, in, uh, professor of psychology in Harvard, and uh, Timothy Leary uh, went down to Mexico himself. I think he went to Cuernavaca and he had his own mushroom experience. And this was, again, this was a professor of psychology who had a PhD in psychology from UC Berkeley. And he said he learned more about the mind in five hours under the influence of magic mushrooms than he had in 15 years studying psychology as a, as a college student. And that's a remarkable, a remarkable statement. And um, Timothy Leary would, would go on to kind of and it developed this idea that we now have of set and setting, of mindset and physical setting, ways to reduce the negative experience of working with these, these substances and these plant medicines. And um, he would go on to, to, to view LSD, not magic mushrooms, as kind of the panacea, as right, the, the cure for kind of the modern condition. And he kind of espoused that idea of, um, uh, turn on, tune in, and drop out, right? As kind of a way to reject the cultural programming that sometimes seems so strong. And in the face of, the, in the 1960s, in the face of things like Vietnam and, and, um, and going to war and, and things like that, and the draft, and in, in the face of all of that, uh, a lot of these substances had the effect of of making people realize that, hey, maybe I don't want to fight and die for my country and kill someone that I don't even know, right? And that's kind of the origin of the hippie movement, the psychedelic 1960s hippie movement, kind of, uh, the, kind of the origin of the ecology movement, the uh, I, kind of the origin of a lot of these kind of new age spiritual movements is a lot of them have their root in the experience, the psychedelic experience that... Uh, that we see with a lot of these substances. Um, let's see. Okay. Yes, I've heard about that. Okay. Uh, definitely. Um, I don't have much more for you, and it's getting a little bit late. Um, and so I'll ask if there are any comments or questions, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. Um, let's see. Do I have a trip report? I was going to maybe share a trip report. Let's see if I have a trip report. Um, I, I will just say we didn't even get into some other interesting things about the CIA, Albert Hoffman, things like that. Um, 
I think we're, we might have to leave those for another day. Um, and so um, what I will what I will end with is this trip report here. Let's see, isn't there? Any... Um, this is Albert Hoffman's. This is the first description of a magic mushroom trip in the Western world here. Albert Hoffman, uh, his famous description of taking 32 dried mushrooms, sounds like a lot to me. He says, things began to appear unsettling and strange. Streets had been demonically transformed. His room became suddenly encrusted with Mexican designs and motifs. And the doctor leaning over him to check his pulse was transformed into a rather menacing Aztec priest. I would not have been astonished, Hoffman later wrote, if he had drawn an obsidian knife. As the colors and designs grew stronger and stronger, he feared he would be torn into this whirlpool of form and color and would dissolve. And I think we'll probably get into um, the CIA and Albert Hoffman a little bit more when we talk about uh, morning glories, because uh, with peyote, magic mushrooms, and morning glories, we have the Mexican trifecta of psychedelic plants. Um, all right, any comments or questions, guys? All right, anything online? Let's see, any comments or questions online? We've got Gina, Selena, Jethro, Lucia, Mary, Sarah. Welcome, guys, I'm so glad you're here. Got an announcement, perfect. We have an announcement from our uh, club president. Do you wanna come over and give us an announcement? And um, do you want to announce the next one? Or... Uh, March 3rd. Okay. Um, so I have an announcement for next week on Valentine's Day. We are having a fundraising event. Um, we will be down here in the walkway between Greek Theater and North Hall. Um, we are doing a giveaway. So any purchase of one of the goodie bags we have or donation towards the club you will receive a ticket to go into um, the drawing, and then you will re be receiving a box of Ferrero Rocher and a teddy bear. So that is coming up on Valentine's Day. Um, then our next uh, comic hawk will be on March 31st. It'll be on Datura. So please attend, please be there. Great. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you and we'll see you next time.